over 185 people show up for the all-day teaching on the book of Revelation. We actually had to buy more lunches at Chick-fil-A than we had planned. We had to call them and say, help, praise the Lord. That's a great problem to have. We bought 200 lunches and they are all gone. And so it was a great day. And praise the Lord, my voice has held out wonderfully. And uh, like I say, I've already recorded 12 radio programs this morning at the radio station. i got a Bible study tonight, preaching again tomorrow. And the Lord's good. He's real good. And, and it's, as I told the group that was there on Saturday, it was an encouragement to me to see so many people hungry for the Word of God Amen. and wanting to sit. I mean, I preached for six and a half hours yes. on Saturday. And uh, what, a, what an amazing day it was. And the response has been tremendous already. I'm going to pick up where we left off last week. If you go in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. Remember, we had looked at the story of Jesus healing the man of blindness with a couple of touches. And we saw how it had nothing to do with Jesus' power outage or anything. It had nothing to do with the man's faith. And, but he was teaching his disciples. His disciples have had their eyes opened a little bit to who He is. He's using them. And they're getting more excited about what God's going to do through them and how important they're going to become than really what Jesus is trying to teach them. And so He heals this man of blindness with a couple of touches. And the guy says, oh, I can, my eyes are opened a little. I can see things now. But people look like trees walking around. And Jesus touched him a second time and he could see more clearly. And so that's why we looked last week at the fact that all of us have had our eyes open if we trust in Jesus. And then, but we need to keep in mind that we need that daily walk, that daily touch from Him for that clear understanding. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what happens next in our story here in Mark. But then we're going to jump to chapter 9 and then jump to chapter 10 to see something very interesting about this episode that hopefully today will help us understand a little bit more about humility. And to be honest with you guys, let's be straight up honest. As we men get older, that's something we need. Mm. Amen. That's something we need. Thank you. One of the most godly evidences of the Spirit is a man who's older, who's gentle, mm. who's humble, who's meek, who's learned a lot over the years but doesn't feel like it's his job to tell everybody, <laughs> but willing to share when people are willing, wanting to ask. And unfortunately, like happens to many of us, and, and, and I'm getting older too. I'm not as old as, as you are. <laughs> but, I, uh, but at the same time, I can see myself wanting to pontificate. I don't even know what the word means, but I've heard people use it. But at the same time, here's the deal. One of the evidences of the Spirit is gentleness. Not crankiness, not control, but gentleness. So listen to what happens next. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, and he, this is Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the, scri and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And they said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, mm. for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what, man, what can man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in his glory of his Father and the holy angels. Now, we proudly know how we think things should go in life. Right? I mean, let's be honest. Let's not pretend to be something we're not. We all kind of know how we think things ought to go. Mm -hmm. We too, like Peter, I think, I've kind of meditated on this as I was studying this passage. I think we too, like Peter, probably would have tried to talk Jesus out of going to the cross. Mm -hmm. You put yourself in that situation, mm -hmm. we too probably would have tried to talk Him out of it. We would have said, no, 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 you're the fulfillment of the Scriptures. And, and, and we would have even used prophecies to tell Jesus that going to the cross wasn't right. Mm -hmm. 
But now on this side of the cross, we see who was right. Amen. It was Jesus. And I'm going to say this, and I hope you amen it. Aren't we glad Jesus was right? <laughs> if Peter was right, we'd be all be heading to hell. We'd all be heading straight to hell with no remedy. Because there is no plan B, by the way, in God's plan. Amen. There's only one way for man to be saved, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no other name under heaven by which we must be born again. Jesus is the way and the truth and life, and no one can go to the Father except through Him. And if Jesus had not been faithful to the Father's plan, even though His flesh didn't like it, if He had not been faithful to the Father's plan, we'd be all destined for hell. Jesus also, though, knew where Peter's thoughts were actually coming from. That's why he turns, puts his back to Peter, and he said, Get behind me, Satan. You know why Jesus knew that these words were coming through Peter, but from Satan? Because Jesus has already been in the wilderness with Satan, and Satan had already tried three times to keep him from going to the cross. Amen. If you go back and look at that story of the temptation of Jesus, what Jesus is going through in the temptation is Satan actually saying, you don't have to do it this way. You can go throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple, and you know the Scripture says, and he misquotes or takes it out of context, Psalm 91, if you just fall down here, you won't dash your foot against a stone. The people will believe in you. And actually, he says, I'll tell you what, you, you want to die for this world? I'll tell you what, you want the kingdoms of this world? Because you know Daniel had already said that the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. Mm. Revelation is going to say that later on. At this point, though, he, John hadn't written Revelation. But listen to what, what I want you to hear. Satan comes to him and he says, you just bow down and worship me and I'll give you the whole, all these kingdoms. I'll give it, I've got it right now. I'll give it to you. Of course, you know and I know, the moment he bowed down to worship Satan, he would have broken God's law, which said have no other gods. Mm. He would have not been the sinless sacrifice. Mm. He could not be the sacrificial Perfect. lamb. But Satan was in essence saying, you don't have to do it this way. There's other ways. Even though Jesus knew there was only one way. If you even know, when Jesus is in the garden right before the cross, what is His flesh tempt? What's, it, what's, what's His flesh wanting to do? Lord, if there's any other way, if there's any way you can remove this cup from me, if we can do this another way, I'm for it. Never, never, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be, yours be done. Mm. So Satan was the one who was working through Peter to try to get Jesus from going to the cross. But that doesn't get Peter off the hook. <laughs> That's why the Bible says in the book of James that we should all be quick to what? Listen. Listen and slow to speak. Slow to speak. We all should be quick to listen and slow to speak. And that will keep us from allowing Satan to use our lips as well. I gotta be honest with you. I got a quick tongue. Mm. My brain doesn't work real good in a lot of situations. You know, my wife and kids, they love to play uh, card games that are fast, you know, where they're all doing this stuff. I'm not good at those. And I even just say, look, I'm not going to have any fun. You just go ahead and play them. I can't. My brain doesn't work fast enough. But you know where my brain does work fast? My brain works fast with a quick wit and a dig. Mm. We were all sitting at lunch on Sunday after church, and my daughter, who was just turned 29 this past week. She was there and her boyfriend that she's got, she just met him. I mean, she's only known for a month or two. He had come down from Maryland and, and they, he was there with us and we're all sitting at lunch and we got talking about the fact that I don't eat breakfast and my wife was complaining about the fact that I had passed that on to a couple of my other kids and stuff. And one kid was like, well, I like breakfast, but I, my breakfast is this. And my daughter's boyfriend per, perks up and says, Oh, for me, because he's a single guy living in Maryland, working for Amazon, doing high-tech stuff. He says, a lot of times my breakfast is a, a banana or some yogurt. And you know what came out of my mouth mm. like this? Mm. I said, add a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, he doesn't know me yet. <laughs> he doesn't know my type of humor. And I just called him a girl in front of his girlfriend. <laughs> And I was so embarrassed. <laughs> if we're a little bit slower to speak, mm. Satan mm. won't be able to use our lips as much. Mm. Go over to Mark chapter 9. Look at verses 30 through 32. You're going to hear something kind of similar. 
Mark chapter 9, verse 30. And they went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he, Jesus, didn't want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will arise. But they didn't understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Go back to Mark chapter 8 again. Look at verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise. And then in that situation, he had just told them he was going to die. Three days later, I'm going to rise. And Peter's reaction is, no, 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 no. Let me rebuke you. Mm. Now he says it again later on, a little bit further on in their journeys. He says the same thing. He says, guys, I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. And three days later, I'm going to rise. This time, though, they don't argue with him. But they don't understand. But instead of humbling themselves and saying, could you explain what you're talking about? I don't understand. They just are afraid to ask. So let's stop for a minute. Let's meditate on the word. Why do you think they were afraid? Why do you think they were afraid to ask? Let me, let me pose the question this way. Do you think they were afraid Jesus would snap at them? Yes. yes. No, I, I don't no. think so. That was my first thought, too. I think they were afraid of the answer. Well, that might be part of it as well, Preston. But listen, listen to where I'm going. This Jesus, he doesn't snap. Jesus is the one who taught us in James chapter <clears throat> 1, verse 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives it generously without reproach. So if the Scripture says that when we need wisdom and we ask God, He'll give it to us freely without reproach, that means that that's who God is, so Jesus wouldn't snap at them. He couldn't snap at them. There are times that He'll say, are you still without understanding and different things like that? But unfortunately, some of the translations that we have today have Jesus saying, are you still dull? Mm. Well, that sounds really harsh, but that's a, unfortunately a bad English translation. Mm -hmm. What the Greek's actually saying is, is Jesus said, are you still lacking understanding? Mm -hmm. They turned it into, are you still dull? No, Jesus wouldn't snap at him. He wants us to ask. Isn't he the one who stood there and said, ask, seek, knock? Because the one who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, the door will be open. So they couldn't have been afraid that Jesus would snap at them. And if they were, they would have been totally wrong. There is a chance that, like Preston said, they might have been afraid of the answer. But I think there's another element, and I may be wrong on this. I think they might be afraid of looking dumb. Amen. Let's be honest. We don't like looking dumb, do we? I was... Uh, part of a group from our church that went and did a project in Dubai. And while we were out there, we took a day where we went into the city. And while we were out there, we uh, got lost. There was a group of us, and we tried to find this one place to eat that we had been told about. The food was good. We found something very interesting, though, about the culture of the people up over there. They don't want to look bad. Honor is a big, important thing. So if you ask them a question they don't know the answer to, they'll still answer it pretending like they do. Mm. So we went up and asked somebody, could you help us find such and such a place? They said, oh, no problem. Go down the street and take a ride. So we do. Mm. By the way, we realized later on, he had no idea where this place was, but he wasn't going to tell us. Because that would make him look bad. You understand? By the way, we got good and lost. It was a miracle of God we got back to our hotel eventually. But here's what the thing is. All of us are like that. All of us don't want to look dumb. A lot of times you feel like me. You'll say something dumb and you'll get caught on it. And instead of just saying, you're right, I was stupid. We'll say, no, I didn't mean it that way. I was really saying. Guys, what God's looking for for us is humility. Being willing to say I don't understand. If you're like me, there's a lot in your life you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Actually, God's ways are higher than our ways. Isn't that what Isaiah 55 tells us? How He does things is not how we do things. And we should expect most of the time 
to not understand, unless we're living by our own life and our own plans and our own ways. If we're trying to walk in the Spirit, most of the time the answer that we should have to God is, okay, I'll do it. I don't get it. I don't understand it. And we don't wait until we understand it before we obey. We just say, Lord, I trust you. You've spoken. Let's go. But I have to be honest. I'm a little curious how this is all going to play out. How could this work? And what God's looking for is humility. Now, we're not going to take the time to read the next verses because there's something else I need to show you in chapter 10. But if you look at verses 33 and following, they're all arguing with each other about what? Who's going to be the greatest? Go to, no, who says where is coming up next? Go to Mark chapter 10. Go to Mark chapter 10 and look at verses 32 through 45. And they're on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. Now we've got to stop real quick. Why are the disciples amazed and afraid that he's going to Jerusalem? They don't understand about him going and being killed and dying and three days later rising from the dead. So it's not tied to that. Mm. But it kind of is. They just don't know it. What had happened to Jesus the last time he was in Jerusalem? They tried to kill him. They tried to kill him. And so they're like, you're going back there? <laughs> so he's heading back there resolutely, knowing what will happen to him. By the way, boy, does that sound like what Paul said in Acts chapter 20? He said, look, I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know the specifics of what's going to play out, but I do know this. The Holy Spirit has warned me that in every city, hardship and imprisonment await. And then later on in chapter 21, a prophet named Agabus comes and takes Paul's belt, ties his own hands and his own feet. And he said this, thus says the Holy Spirit, the owner of this belt will be bound when he goes to Jerusalem. Now the rest of the church said, that means you're not supposed to go. Paul said, actually, that confirms what God's already been showing me. I'm willing to die in Jerusalem if that's the Lord's will. And they, the scripture then said since he wouldn't be persuaded to change his mind, they, he, they said the will of the Lord be done. But again, Paul knew what the will of the Lord was and he went to Jerusalem knowing that it was going to be a, a, a tough situation. Jesus, knowing what is coming, went in obedience to the Father. But as they're walking, in taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they'll condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they'll mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him, and after three days he will rise. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever noticed that? Three times at least, we only have recorded three times, but three times at least, in Jesus' travels with his disciples in the last weeks of his life, he told them, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. But three days later, I will arise. Yet, it isn't until after he rose from the dead that it finally clicked. By the way, Ralph and any other preachers that are here, let me tell you something. This is an encouragement to me. Mm. Because here is Jesus, and he's preaching the truth of God, and their were, first reaction was they disagreed. Told him he was wrong. Mm. I've been a pastor long enough. I've had lots of people when I know God has said this is where we're supposed to go as a church who hold me aside and say that, that, that can't be it. But not only that, then he says it again and they don't understand and they just talk about it amongst themselves behind his back because they don't dare ask it. <laughs> Buddy, I'm telling you I've had that happen too. Mm. How many people have said he's nuts but mm. they wouldn't dare ask mm. And on top of that, now, if you notice in this one, he starts pouring out his heart. They're going to hand me over to the Gentiles. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to kill me. But three days later, I'll rise. And look at what happens next in the very next verse. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, said pretty much, are you done your lesson? Because we got something else we'd like to talk to you about. How many of us have shared the Word, mm. taught the Word, mm. Taught our Sunday school class. And when the class is over, everybody's like, where's lunch? <laughs> James and John and the sons of Zebedee came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. <laughs> Jesus said to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said, actually, you're right. 
the cup that I drink, you will drink. In other words, you're going to die too. You'll be put to death for your mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. And the baptism with which I'm baptized, you'll be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. Mm -hmm. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And they're probably indignant because they, they asked them first. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Mm. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus is, does a couple of things here. We're going to, in the time we have left, kind of unpack a lot that's here. Jesus is saying to them, he said, look, you guys are all jockeying for position, and that's not how it's supposed to be. Wow. Oh, and by the way, in my ministry of traveling around the country and parts of the world to go preach the gospel and to help churches get back to the Word and to follow in the Lord, let me tell you, our churches are full of jockeying for position. Mm. There are special parking spaces and special seats. And uh, I, I go to a lot of churches where a lot of guys love wearing their name tag. Mm. <laughs> that says they're a deacon. I actually went and spoke at a church recently, within this past month. And while I got there, a man walks up to me and let me know that he was head trustee. <laughs> That's the first thing he said. I'm so-and-so, I'm head trustee. And I have an office here. That's what he told me. Now the prophet in me wanted to, but I kept my mouth shut, hey, nice to meet you. I've been in other positions where the, the, the deaconesses I was at a church in Chicago where the deaconesses all wore white. Mm. So everybody would know they are in that special group and they had a special seating in the mm. sanctuary. Mm. 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 We could go on and on. But there's something else here I want to pull out before we come back to jockeying for position. Jesus makes a very interesting statement, and I'm going to throw something out for you guys to chew on. Jesus said, look at verse 40, to sit at my right hand or at my left, is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Mm -hmm. Now hang on for a second. Doesn't Jesus later on say, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me? Wouldn't you think that it would be Jesus' to grant who's going to sit on his right and his left? Because all authority has been given to him. But at this moment, he said it's already been prepared. Ooh. It's already been determined who's going to sit there. And I think the scriptures actually tell us I'm going to throw it out to you. When Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom on the earth, I think the Bible has already told us that David, King David, is going to sit at his right hand in Jerusalem. Jesus is going to sit on the, David's throne, but David is going to be his prince. Go, go with me real quickly to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34. Those of you that were all day at the all-day Bible study on prophecy and revelation, you didn't get this because I didn't even get half of the stuff I wanted to give. There wasn't enough time in six and a half hours. Look at Ezekiel 34, 22 through 24. God says, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I'll set up over them one shepherd, my servant who? David. David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Now, there are some people that try to say David means Jesus, but I don't yeah. think it does. Yeah. Go with me to Hosea chapter 3. Go to Hosea chapter 3. In Hosea chapter 3, look at verses 4 and 5. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or, ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come and fear the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Mm -hmm. There's more, but that's enough to give you an idea. I think the Bible hints at the fact that God's already determined who's going to be where. Prince. He's going to be his prince. Now listen closely. If you do a full study of Ezekiel, and you'll see Ezekiel was already shown where all the nations, the tribes of Israel are all going to be put in the, in, the, in the millennial kingdom. 
and it's totally different from than it was when you brought them in the first time. You go compare where the Reubenites or the Gadites or wherever went, and then where they're going to be in the kingdom, it's going to be different. Amen. God's already got that all set up. Do you realize that in Acts 17, verse 31, the Bible says God's already set the day of judgment? Amen. It's already been set. It's not waiting on us. As soon as we get the gospel to the whole world. No, the gospel's already been going to the whole world all along. But when the Bible, Jesus said in Matthew 24, when this gospel is preached to the whole world, then the end will come. He's talking about the angel that's going to preach at the end of the tribulation period, the everlasting gospel, one last time to everyone in the world, and then the end comes. The gospel has been preached to the whole world. That, Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, this gospel which has been preached in all creation. Romans chapter 10, verse 18, have they not heard? Of course they have. His word has gone into all the earth. God's gospel has been preached. Everyone hears. Everybody hears at different amounts, but everyone hears and everyone has enough to be saved. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that God's already set the day and it's in motion. Amen. So i got a question then for you. Doesn't the Bible teach us, though, that how we live on this life in this earth will determine our rewards in the kingdom and in the life to come? Yeah. Yes. Now, who's going to sit on who's right and who's going to sit on his left and all that stuff? That's already been determined. Yet, don't sit back and say, well, I guess how I live here doesn't make a difference. No, 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 no. The Bible actually says in many places, and I'm going to hit two or three real fast to let you out in time because i got to be somewhere myself. The Bible says very clearly that how we live on this life will determine what our reward is in the life to come. And how you get great reward in the life to come is taking the low road in this life. Amen. You don't jockey for position. Go to Matthew chapter 19. <clears throat> Look at verse 30, uh, 28 through 30. Matthew 19, 28 through 30. <clears throat> Jesus said, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be what? Yes. Last. And the last will be what? First. first. Jump over to chapter 20. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> so the last will be what? First, and the first will be what? Last. Last. Go to Luke 13. Luke 13, 29 through 30. <coughs> and people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. You want to store up reward? Because the Bible says how we live in this life does affect our reward in the life to come. Certain things have already been pre prepared and already determined. Don't worry about those. But what does God want to give you? Mm. How you take, or how you get that is how you take the low road here. Amen. When I played college basketball, one of the things we learned is that when the opponent starts to talk trash, you got him. <laughs> Here's why. Because if you don't think you're good enough to beat somebody, you're going to puff yourself up and look bigger than you are. And when you start telling the other team, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, we automatically knew we got them. They're afraid. They're puffing themselves up to look bigger than they are. They know that they can't. And we had determined ahead of time, we aren't going to talk about what we're going to do. We're just going to let the basketball determine what we do. We have a tendency to do that, don't we? Yeah. We have a tendency to try to you know, talk about how many people showed up when I spoke, and how many did this, and how many did that, and how many. We want everybody to be impressed with us. Jesus says, if you really believe that I'm good, and that there's no door that I open a man can't shut, mm. And that whatever I have for you, if you walk in obedience to me, you'll have. Amen. You don't care whether or not anybody notices <laughs> or anybody's impressed with you. And you'll just take the low road. Oh, and one day, you may be sitting in that low road or that low seat. I may say, come up here. Don't go taking the best seat. Mm. Take the, lo the lowest seat. Mm. There's nothing wrong with the prayer of Jabez and the mm -hmm. fact of, Lord, I want you to expand my borders and, and enlarge my tent sakes. But listen, Lord, you do it. Uh -huh. The moment you start trying to enlarge your tent stakes, one of the biggest problems in Christian ministry today is all the businesses that are out there wow. to market ministry. Mm -hmm. 
I would get as pastor letters from companies saying, we can double your attendance in one year. We can do this. We can do that. And it was all man's ways of making it big. Mm. <laughs> My attitude has been the opposite. I want to just do it the crazy way and just trust the Lord. Amen. Amen. And we've seen God do things more than we ever would have dreamed. Guys, this is going to be a daily thing. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to let Satan speak through you a few times when you're quick to speak and not slow, not, and not slow to speak. We're not going to do this perfectly, but my prayer is in the days to come, between now and when we see Jesus face to face, people will see less and less of us Thank you, and more and more of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bless you. Amen. Amen.